everyone, welcome to Know Your Rights with me, Ambika Hirnandani. I'm going to be bringing you this series in collaboration with my friends at Shebang for Good. Know Your Rights is a series of podcasts in which we intend to sort of explain to you what your legal rights are in some of the more tricky situations that life throws at us. Today we're going to be discussing the wildlife trade. I've been an animal rights and environmental activist for over 15 years and over these years I've gotten multiple phone calls from people across India who have called up saying, hey, I can see a monkey being sold to someone, I can see star tortoises being sold at pet shops, I see parakeets in cages and this absolutely breaks my heart. And then what happens is I spend the next few hours trying to explain to this person what they can do to help this animal in distress, which is why we decided to make a very composite short video to explain to you what you can do as an individual when you see this happening to a wild animal around you. We all know how awful the wildlife trade is. So to explain more about the laws and what we can do to help wild animals is my good friend Sumanth. Sumanth is a senior manager with the Humane Society India International. He works on disaster relief and wildlife rescues. He has rescued elephants from conflict. He has rescued pangolins from the wildlife trade. He's a complete expert in this area and an extremely nice person. So welcome, Sumanth. So let's get started and let me ask you our first question. A lot of people get confused between what are domestic animals and what are wild animals. Now, I had to learn this because of all the work that we do. But could you, in a really sort of simple way, explain what is the distinct, what distinguishes these two animals? Of course. Uh, first of all, Ambika, thank you so much for having me on this. Uh, I think it's a great thing that you're doing. More of us need to know our laws. Uh, coming to the questions that you asked on what is wild animals and what are domestic animals, I think the distinction can be really, really simple. Animals that you are allowed to keep at home as companion animals and animals that, are, that you are allowed to rear are all domestic animals. Anything outside of that is wild animal. Any animal that is found wild in nature are wild animals. For instance, everything from your snakes to your birds to tigers and crocodiles and elephants are all wild animals. But your dogs, cats, cows all come under domestic animals. Right. <clears throat> and also I know that the, the law that governs wild, sort of the protection of wild animals is the Wildlife Protection Act. So could you tell us a little bit about the schedules in the Wildlife Protection Act and like, you know, how they're, di how they're distributed? Because I know that, you know, Schedule 1 are the most, in uh, most endangered and then there's Schedule 2. So could you tell us a little bit about which animals come into Schedule 1, which animals come into Schedule 2? Sure. Uh, and that's great. That's the Wildlife Protection Act that we have in India that was passed in 1972 is probably one of the best wildlife acts we have around the globe. Uh, in this act, what, what uh, the writers of the act have done is they've taken all the wild animals that are found in India and split them into five different schedules. Uh, schedule 1, like you said, are all the animals that need that little bit of extra protection because they're, the, uh, they're on the verge of extinction or they're endangered or threatened by poaching or other activities. Schedule 2, 3, 4 and 5 have, uh, get slightly less levels of protection simply because they are probably more abundant in number. For example, all your tigers, elephants, pangolins, leopards are all in Schedule 1. Uh, your other species like your macaques are all in Schedule 2. Uh, wild hogs, wild pigs that is, wild boar all come in schedule 3. Then there are several, several birds and snakes and other reptiles that come down to schedule 4. And schedule 5 uh, is, is a bit iffy. The schedule 5 is what's uh, all the animals that are declared as vermin, which basically means that the government believes that there are too many of these animals and hence they are uh, classified as vermin, which basically includes rats, mice, crows and uh, for some very strange reason it shouldn't be but bats. So <clears throat> could you explain to me, could you give me a couple of instances in which we, in which an average person could see a wild animal in trade? Could you give us a few instances that you've seen in your career? Sure. Um, and I think this is, this is the misconception we have. Whenever we talk about the illegal wildlife trade, we always think about this as happening some far, in some faraway land somewhere else and it doesn't affect us or we don't see it. The reality is that there is illegal wildlife trade happening all around us. We just don't notice it because we don't know what is wildlife, like you said. Uh, the most common instances of these are astrologers who walk around with these parakeets in boxes, in little wooden boxes, and they claim to tell your fortune. Uh, there are many of those. And then there are people who come with monkeys 
uh, monkeys in all sorts of costumes and they set up street plays with these. These are very, very common. And what is fortunately becoming less common now are snake charmers. We often ignore, when we talk about wildlife, we often think of elephants and tigers and all these big mega fauna, right? We completely ignore snakes that are all around us in cities, more than jungles, in fact. And snake charmers who bring snakes in baskets, it's a horrible, it's a very, very cruel practice. And again, all of these species are protected under the Wildlife Protection Act, under various schedules, but all of them are still exploited in trade. Uh, a few years back, we used to see a Schedule 1 species very commonly in trade, in cities, and those were sloth bears being brought to dance in front of us for entertainment. Those are Schedule 1 species. Today, you can't think of how that used to, that practice used to exist up until like five years ago. Uh, it, it, it blows me away. Uh, and unfortunately, what's still very common is elephants, captive elephants, which are again, elephants are Schedule 1 species, being used to beg on roads, being used for entertainment and weddings and other uh, festivities, all Schedule 1 species still being widely used all around us. I just wanted to kind of understand from you, when I was watching this David Attenborough's, you know, latest um, <clears throat> documentary, he said that to, to kind of get one orangutan out of the wild, they had to kill 10 and 12. And I know for a fact that when, when we rescued birds and we would talk to a lot of the traders, they used to tell us things that, you know, like to, to for one, for one animal to survive out of the trade, there are so many who die along the way. And <clears throat> there are all sorts of practices that are adopted to, to, to trap animals. So for example, they actually injure one animal. So the other animals come running to save the animal and they trap all of them. So I think they do this with birds. So could you tell us a little bit about the types of practices that are used by people to trap wild animals? Uh, that's so true, Amika. What you said is so true. I think wild animals are often trapped in the most horrific manner. Uh, we've I've seen several instances of parakeets being traded, right? These rose ring parakeets and Alexandrian parakeets who we all very conveniently called parrots. Uh, they're actually not parrots and are parakeets protected under the Act. Uh, these are caught in the most horrific manner. Uh, I've seen one instance, we did a case in Tamil Nadu where, uh, where we found out from traders later that they actually take the young of the parakeet from a nest because nests are fairly easy to identify. They take the young, keep it in a trap cage, which is designed in a way where birds can come in but can't go out. So they keep the young one and they actually poke its eye with like a needle. So it starts screaming and then there are more and more birds coming in because parakeets are community animals. There's more and more birds coming in. A lot of them get trapped in a cage but are unable to go out. And parakeets are the most common pet. Everybody wants to have a parakeet at home because there is this misconception again that parakeets can talk and you can just, it'll be a companion for life kind of thing. So people want parakeets at home uh, and there is, uh, as with all species, there is like a hub where these animals are captured and there's a hub where animals are distributed. Tamil Nadu, unfortunately, has come up as a hub for, for these parakeets. Uh, and when parakeets are trapped there and they're sent to Bombay, Bangalore and other cities, they are sent in buses, in the luggage compartment of buses. And we've seen the most horrific uh, incident a few years ago where we found one cardboard box with several empty toothpaste boxes in them, you know? Oh, and each God. of these toothpaste boxes had like three or four parakeets stuffed in them, uh, just so nobody would be able to detect them while in trade. And the, the unfortunate part is, by the time it reaches its destination, half these animals would have died. But for the folks involved in this, it's so profitable because it that costs they can nothing. To lose that. Exactly it because there's nothing. the whole trade, the, all the shops are totally unregulated. So if the if the shop is unregulated, you can literally sell the animal for anything, and you're gonna get the an you're yes. gonna make a huge margin. And the tragedy is, is that the people who are actually trapping the wild animals are often like you know members of tribal communities, marginalized groups who have so little that these poor things have to, you know, they're, they're literally bullied by these poachers to do this. And then these poachers bring these animals into the cities and sell them at huge profit margins. So I think <clears throat> there's cruelty to the animals. And people also need to understand that when you're funding this and you're going out and you're buying a parakeet, which you think is the most like, you know, you're not harming anyone, you're actually funding an illegal trade because we have no idea where this money goes. There is documented proof in Africa that a lot of the money from the wildlife trade was actually going to fund terrorism. So, you know, 
Yeah. We don't know where this money is going. It's it's a it's an illegal trade, and people need to stop funding it. So thank you for for sharing that very um, uh, painful example. <laughs> so also, could you tell us now? See, I'm going in my car, and I drive mm-hmm. past, and I see a shop which is selling parakeets. It's selling star tortoises. What should I do at that time? Great question, and I think this happens to a lot of us. We yeah. see uh, some some wild animal being sold, but we are clueless about what to do. Uh, or we don't know if we'll get the help we we, yeah. we need. We don't know who to reach out to. Very very common. So the Wildlife Protection Act, like I said, very comprehensive. And what uh, what amazes me the most about the act is how clearly it defines what hunting is. Right. Uh, so anybody who's selling any wild animal is in contravention of the act. And the Wildlife Protection Act also says that uh, there is there's a list of officers who can be contacted when you see any wildlife crime occurring, the most, the easiest thing for us to do, mm-hmm. right, is to reach out to the police. Even though the Wildlife Protection Act is largely uh, manned by the Forest Department, if you do have the number of the Forest Department, well and good. Ever so often, we don't know who, how to contact the Forest Department, we don't know which officer it is. The simplest thing to do is to call the police. According to the Wildlife Protection Act, any police officer above the rank of a sub-inspector is authorized to confiscate the animal, uh, arrest the accused, and then hand over the animal to a suitable place. So if you're driving past, let's say you're driving past a market where you see a pet shop with a bunch of parakeets being sold and a few start orders is being sold, the simplest thing to do f- for you is to not take on that confrontation yourself because you don't know how these things turn out. No. The simplest thing for you to do is, if possible, record a picture or record a video and then call the police, stay there, ensure that the police come there, pass on the information to them, and let them do the job. Never go into this uh, bravado of, I will go and rescue these animals. That can turn out really bad. Wait for the police, they are the ones authorized to do it, or wait for the forest department, let them come, pass on the information to them, and support them with any other resources that you might have. But let the forest department or the police do their role. So basically now I've driven past the shop, I've seen parakeets. I Google the number, mm-hmm. I Google my local forest department of my area. I call them up, I inform them, I call up police mm-hmm. on 100. I say, hey, this is who I am. This is where I'm standing from my car, perhaps at a safe distance or close to the shop. I go, I take some pictures. I wait until the police come back, come to the spot. The police sees the animals and then they take the animals to the police station. Now, what is my next step? Do I need to give a complaint? Should I write anything down? Should I give a statement? Do I need to do anything? Well, uh, it would be great if you can give a complaint. That just makes the case a lot stronger when it finally goes to court. Right. Uh, Because you are the person, you are the informant, you are the one who's seeing it. And your complaint has to be really simple. Your complaint just has to say where you saw, what you saw, uh, how, what was being done there. It's perfectly fine if you don't know what act, what section this this is in prohibition of, it's perfectly fine. As long as you can outline the crime that has occurred with right. as many specifics as possible in a written form, right. that's that should be more than enough. The police can then do the do the job of filing the actual complaint in court and doing all of the all of the rest of it. If the police do the case, they will hand over the animals to the forest department. If the forest department do the case themselves, they will then hand over the uh, animals either to a rescue center or to a rehab facility. But from your side, your task ends at informing the police about it, ensuring that they come there, ensuring they take action, and if possible, giving the same complaint in writing to them. So basically, I need to say, for example, now as I said, I've, I found these animals, um, I've called the police, I've called the forest mm-hmm. department, one of the two have showed up, they have caught yes. the person whose shop it is, they have taken the animals in the cages, We have all gone to the police station. There at the police station, I'm going to give a basic statement saying my name is Ambika Hirnandani. I'm 36 years old. I'm a resident of X. This is my telephone number. This is my email address. I was going from point A to point B. And from point A to point B, at point C, I saw this particular pet shop. This is the name of the pet shop. Perhaps WhatsApp the pictures of the pet shop to the police people, to the forest department. These are the pictures that... I saw, I mean, that I've, that I've taken at yeah. the spot. These are the animals that I saw being traded. 
and I believe that this is a contravention of the Wildlife Protection Act and I request you to kindly take action in this particular case. That, in your opinion, is sufficient for a well-wisher who sees a wild animal being traded. Absolutely. Now, if I see my neighbor has parrots, parakeets, sorry, <laughs> or if I see that um, there's somebody who comes with a monkey every day in my colony to make the monkey do a bit of a dance, what should I do at that point of time? Is there any inf other information that you have for people who can sort of help animals? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think one of the key things to remember is for animals that are used in entertainment. Let's say, for example, the, uh, uh, the example you mentioned of, of a monkey being used in street shows or uh, wild animals being used in circuses. Right. The simplest thing that you can do uh, in order to ensure that it comes to a meaningful end is not support it and ask your family and friends to not pay money to watch any of these. That's the very simplest first thing that you need to do. Right. Even otherwise, let's say you're walking uh, in, in a market and you see, uh, as in most village fairs or wherever, even in town fairs, yeah. you see these monkeys being exhibited for, for entertainment. Again, the simplest thing to do, and there it becomes slightly easier because there is anyway a crowd watching and there's a lot of picture, a lot of people taking pictures, taking videos. So it's very easy for you to just stand there and record the entire thing, right? And nobody's going to question why you're recording it because everybody is doing it. So again, record it stand there don't leave the place and go because what happens very often is let's say i see it now let's say i go back home in an hour and i call the police and say an hour an hour before this uh, i saw monkeys being used here right there's a very good chance that whoever the authorities are will go there and say we didn't find anything here because so the authorities also may not know exactly where it is no so our kind of job Correct. is to be a guide you know to kind of take what we have started to a logical conclusion because the fact of the matter is so much animals can't speak right so we really have exactly. to be their voice so we so yeah. the, what your base what your main advice to us is to kind of be there stick around make sure that the authorities come same with neighbors yes. this could apply to so could you now these are some very obvious places where we see wild animals around us could you explain some mm -hmm. cases in which you could like you know experience a wild animal being traded without you know to, without sort of uh, it happening right in front of your eyes for example like could there be products that we could get perhaps that could have a component of an animal's body like could you just explain something to us that you know that that sort of an, a regular activist like me would would not you know would know but uh, or somebody like you would know oh yeah uh, we and we've seen several of those as well because all of these guys who are treated who are training in wild animals all right. their parts are aware that they're doing something illegal. So they are not going to be supertly uh, open about it, right? Right. Uh, we had these instances a few years ago, again, when we did a case where there were dhabas along a highway that connected, connects Bangalore to Tumkur. Uh, and in all of these dhaba, in about four or five of these dhabas along the highway, they were selling monitor lizard meat and monitor lizard eggs. Now, monitor lizards, mind you, are in Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act. Uh, so they deserve the same level of protection a tiger does or an elephant does. Uh, the way we found out about it was somebody who was stopping there uh, and consuming regular meals, or at least they think it was regular meal. They don't, they're not sure what meat it was anymore. Right. But uh, they happened to peek into the kitchen and in the refrigerator, they saw what looked like monitor lizards to them, like frozen monitor lizards. Uh, and they then alerted us. So we had to work with the authorities to go there uh, and investigate and we found about 39, 39 to 40 monitor lizards frozen in the refrigerator, all killed and frozen in the refrigerator. So these are very, very common. Uh, monitor lizard meat, wild boar meat, spotted deer meat, very commonly available uh, in a lot of highway restaurants. And the easiest way for us as commoners to find out about it is if there are places we frequent, once you get a bit you, once you get to know the owners or the servers at the dhaba or at these restaurants, they will open up to you. But the other most common place where we see a lot of animal articles being sold, wildlife articles being sold, are in small uh, handicraft stores where they sell like a uh, they sell a ring with an elephant hair inside it, right. or they sell uh, a, a bangle with elephant ivory in them. Uh, and in most of these places, if you go as an ignorant uh, bystander, they will be forthcoming. Uh, but whereas me as an activist, if I go there and say, uh, are, you, are you selling elephant ivory? They're going to say no, obviously. Uh, but the simplest thing to do is to go as a common bystander and you, you'd be amazed at the kind of information you'll uncover from it.
So Suman, so basically your face is plastered with all the wildlife traders. You know, this is this is a person that we have to stay far away from. No, so I understand what you're saying. So basically, what we really need to do is, if we want to help wild animals, is that we just need to stay vigilant. And I remember that you know when I went with um, a colleague of ours, actually, when I went with Gauri to Jammu because we were working on a case uh, there, we stopped at a handicraft shop, and she actually started talking about different types of shawls and things like that to understand if there were any violations that were taking place. And immediately, the shop owner said no. I don't have any, but if you really do like it, perhaps I can, you know, organize. And we we could see that, you know, he was starting to come up with information. So you're absolutely right. So for anybody who really sort of cares for animals, what you really need to do is keep your eyes open. You know, look, listen, be aware. And if you see anything possibly untoward, where could be a wild, where the wild animal could be impacted, all we do is pick up the phone, call the authorities. Thank you. This has been so, so. I mean, the information has been really important, and I think it's going to help a lot of people out there in in helping um, wild animals because we know that like their habitats are being destroyed, poachers go in routinely. I mean, cars go into even to like our wildlife parks and things like that. The animals get barely any peace. It's like any way surviving in the wild isn't easy, and then you have all of these external pressures. So I mean. If if all of us don't become campaigners for wild animals, we're going to have none left very very soon. So that's true, and I think the, the what you said really summed it up. Uh, we really just have to be vigilant about it. When we go to a pet store to buy food for our cats and dogs, there could be something being sold there. Just, it's just about opening our eyes and ears and staying vigilant, like you said. That's the best thing to do. And then calling the authorities, making a complaint, being aware of the Wildlife Protection Act, which is very easy to Google on our phones. Thank you so much, Suman. Thank you for taking this time, and thank you for all of your valuable insights. I really appreciate everything you shared with us and everything you do for the animals. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amrita. Thank you for having me on.